Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me are two of our key contributors, Andrew Chesto Chesterton, a double salute this week, and Stephen Stephen Otley. Well, that's a <laughs> cracking nickname. <laughs> That was just off the top, too. <laughs> How did you come, um, where did that come from? That's a, uh, that's a good one. It just came to me. This week, we're looking at why Ford Australia needs the new Maverick pickup. I think it's a burning question, and we will investigate it. Um, we'll also discuss a trio of recent entries to the Cars Guide garage, and never let it be said we don't listen. Uh, with the likes of Hammer, Marco Vest, the Very Fast Train, and Senior, Joining a chorus of listeners and viewers demanding we reinstate the feedback segment, we've done just that. So stand by. Also, uh, YouTubers, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's go. And as I said, the the topic du jour is, let's call it the Baby Ranger, um, or Steve, as, as you theorized, a new Falcon Ute, why Ford Australia needs the new Maverick pickup. And having had a look at the picks and, and just running the eye over the specs, um, I think you're making the point that it would do very well for Ford Australia here. Um, there are obvious impediments in the way, but uh, I, I think it would broaden their offering away from, from Ranger being such a massive part of, of their business here. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the point uh, I made in the story is Ford, you know, for, for decades was the Falcon car company. You know, they they their fortunes rode on the back of the Falcon and, you know, with the Falcon's demise, they've just switched. But instead of becoming a diverse range of imported models, it's the Ranger car company. And like, it's, it's nearly 70% of all Ford sold in the country are Rangers, you know? And we so- I don't know what happened when the Falcon stopped selling or where that left Ford. If the Ranger should stop selling for any reason, they're going to be in the exact same. It's, a, it's an interesting point you raise though, isn't it, Steve? Because the Ranger is so much developed in Australia, um, it maybe culturally is just a, a natural focus on that car. It has quite literally taken the place of Falcon in, in terms of the, the kind of corporate focus. Do you think that's a thing too? Or is yeah, it no, just I, that the thing's popular? No, no doubt. I think that's part of it. I think, I think that speaks to the larger, I mean, that's a larger issue of, I think we've also talked about recently of, of dual cab utes becoming the new family car, you know, for a variety of reasons. Obviously there's, there's tax benefits and whatnot, but they've gotten better. You know, there's no doubt that these that the current breed of dual cab utes are better than we've had in the past, and so they. I think, uh, yeah, for a variety of reasons, like you say, that there is there is that Australian connection. Um, but I just think those those dual cab utes have become so popular, and that's what I think, which gets us back to Maverick, which is uh, it's a dual cab ute. But for those who aren't familiar, the Maverick is effectively uh, a ute based on the Ford Escape. Underpinning, yeah, you know, it's an yeah. SUV based Ute, so Santa it's not, Cruz size, isn't it? Otters? I'm sorry, Santa Cruz size, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, I mean, that's the thing we've seen like, like Hyundai is doing the Santa Cruz at the same time, so yeah, you know, that, and look, we're obviously, at, 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 there's a this is a point here where it could go the way of the Range Rover Evoque convertible, you know, it's just a it's a unique oddity, or, or <laughs> yes. it could be the start of you know, like, you know, like it, it's it seems like a, a strange idea, but. I think if any of us had sat here and said, you know, 10 years, 10 years ago, like they'll be selling, Ford will be selling tons of $75,000 yeah. high performance utes. Everyone That's would right. have laughed at us. So Great point. you just don't know. You just don't know which way the market's going to go. And I think, you know, there, there's obviously some pretty significant uh, upside to the Maverick. I, I yeah. totally agree with that. Nobody did coupe style SUVs until they did and they became the biggest thing. Nobody did yep. Raptor style dual cabs until Ford did and they became the biggest thing. So you, I think they've, they've got an obligation to always push the boundaries. But for Ford and Australia, I, I don't know what the situation there is, but they do actually have a fairly diverse lineup in this country. Sure, they're not taking the best stuff from overseas, but they have got plenty of cars on offer. It's just that nobody wants them. And they're actually, yeah. I, I got out of a Puma ST line long term. I really liked it. it, but they, you know, it, it doesn't even dent the top five in that segment. No. Yeah, well, yeah, well this is the thing in just in researching that story, looking at Ford's lineup, you know, the Escape is, you know, the Puma is a good car. I've driven it. The, the Escape is a, is a perfectly fine SUV, but what does it do that a Mazda CX-5 doesn't do or a RAV4 or a Tucson or a Sportage, yeah. you know, it, yeah. it's very similar. And I think this is the, this is where personally, and I'm sure Ford has 
Ford Australia has a bunch of accountants looking at spreadsheets and crunching numbers and telling me why this stuff doesn't make sense. But to me, they should look to do something different. You know, like why, why sell the Escape, which is sort of a, you know, a bit homogenous in that segment. Why not sell the Bronco Sport? It, um, it's it's, it, to, to me, actually, the, 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 the point you make, Steve, is that'd be the problem, wouldn't it? A bunch of accountants looking at the That's spreadsheets, exactly. whereas you really need a little more instinct um, and, and a little more let's gamble a bit and take a bit of a risk rather than play to our strength, which is selling shed loads of ranges. Let's try and broaden things and, and maybe do even better, a bit of adventure. But well, this is the thing I, I think so frustrating yeah. about. Oh, sorry. I mean, what, what I yeah. find so frustrating about it is Ford internationally is actually like one of the coolest car brands. They have such great product from the, you know, the Bronco, the F-150, the Maverick, the new F-150 Lightning, like all these exciting, game-changing, envelope-pushing vehicles. Yeah. Just none of them are in Australia. And Marky, you know, yeah, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, 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 but see, yeah, exactly. But see, you said Ford internationally, but what you're talking about is Ford of America. Yeah, we Ford get all of our cars out of Ford out of Europe, yeah. which are a bit more homogenous. You know, they just yeah. don't, they don't stand out like the, I think, and this is the th point I think I made in the story is it'd be great if we could align ourselves more. And if you look at the taste of Australian, yeah, 100%. you know, cars and fashion and, and even food these days, we are very, you know, American biased in so many ways. And so, yeah. look, I know it's hard, like, but the, the key thing is the, yeah. the Maverick and the Bronco Sport are both based on the same basic underpinnings as the escape so you, but, you can't but, tell me you can't do it in right hand drive same with i think Bronco. just to just to circle back to the um accountants on the spreadsheets i mean it would also be attractive from that point of view to take product out of Ford of europe because that's where they're primarily building right hand drive for the uk yeah, yeah. so yeah. so that's very tempting okay it's already done great australia can have that so what, it, it's, it's harder the, financially. It's harder in all kinds of ways. But what happened to the one Ford policy? Remember oh, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where did that go? What happened yeah. to that idea? Yeah, that just fell by the wayside. Yeah. yeah. Went, well, actually, we'll have two Fords. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've made this point before, but I can't believe that other car companies, and I, look, some have looked at it, but no one's really been able to act yet. What, why no one's looked at the success of RAM in this country and, and seen that as an indication of shifting tastes? Oh, I think they have. I think they've looked and and uh, various you know ones are trying to engineer a literally yeah. <laughs> engineer yeah. a way to bring uh, equivalents here, um, yeah. but the the size of that market is such that it's it's challenging in all kinds of ways. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah. the the local conversion thing has worked for RAM and others, uh, I think, as you know, well, Chester, um, are investigating that path as well. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's not easy. Yeah. You, you just want things to move a little faster, don't you? It feels like we've been investigating that path for years. <laughs> they will be riding electric helicopters by the time they finally bring them in. It's yeah. true. Well, but, but um, I mean, the other, the, the one that we've spoken about as well is Bronco and Bronco oh. Sport. You, you mentioned them, Steve. Um, Blind Freddy could see that, that they are do well. I know that that's a, a discussion that we've had, but I'm firmly of the view that those, those vehicles would do well right. in Australia also. What I don't understand is, you know, this gets back to the accountants, that like they've engineered right-hand drive out of the Bronco. You yeah. know, they, they started with a car that was left and right-hand drive. drive. And I think, yeah. I think a big part of it is, is the accountants or whatever, and not, not to be too harsh on the, on the accountants of Ford Australia, but, you know, there's, there's the management there, I think, are pessimistic. I, right. I, I think they, you know, because right. they look at Bronco and go, oh, but look, you know, look how many Wranglers Jeep sold. Like, yes. It's the Ford Motor Company. It's the Bronco. Like, you don't think you could yeah. outsell, you know, it's, Wrangler it's just by a, a significant number? Like, it's just a business philosophy, isn't it? And, it? and it always comes from the senior levels. You know, what are we? Are we an adventurous uh, product-led company are we a, a more conservative playing to our strengths let's shore up what we know we'll sell and go for a safe option um, rather than than you know not quite rolling the dice but but being braver yeah i i think ford australia does need to i think actually the key word you said there was adventurous i think mm -hmm. they could actually reinvent themselves mm. uh, as an adventure brand you know as yeah. a brand that has you know, Ranger, Everest, Bronco, Bronco Sport, Maverick, you know, and then yeah. you, can, you can still have Fiesta ST and Focus ST perform with Mustang. And then you're a performance and adventure brand. And maybe you don't sell the same sort of volume, but you're selling cars at a higher, you know, at a higher rate in terms of, you know, you're, you're selling more premium models. You know, we've seen Mazda explore this as a, as a business case and do it quite well. 
Yeah. You know, like I, I just feel like they're in, in many respects, you know, again, I think there's nothing bad per se with Ford's current lineup. You know, they're mm-hmm. not bad cars. Yeah. Um, but it just feels like they're trading water. You know, oh, and, and it, it's also exciting, that's it. I think that there's happens. a chicken and egg as well in the sense of what you promote is is largely what you sell. So yeah. so if you play to your strength and you sell a lot of ranges, it doesn't leave a lot of bickies in the tin to to make a big splurge on your pumas and and others. So maybe it's, you know, those bean counters in more ways than one are, are limiting things. But wouldn't you yeah. think to yourself at some point if you were running Ford in Australia, and this is no disrespect to Ford because, as you say, Stephen, you know, they've got yeah. a, a great fleet of cars, but the reality is people aren't buying them. So at some point you would say to yourself, well, what have we got to lose here? You know, like, are we going to sell fewer cars? We're already selling not many in those segments. Are yeah. we going to sell fewer by changing our strategy? I don't think they would. Well, yeah, this is the thing. I think you would sell more Bronco Sport than you would Escape. Yeah. You know, right. I, the, the Escape is getting outsold by the MGHS. Now, yes. that's, not to, that's not to, you know, give the MG a kick, but that is, a, that is effectively a new brand with yes. a new model, yes. with no heritage in that brand. You know, Ford has been selling Escape for a long time. They've had, Cougar, yeah. they've had cars in that segment and they're not obviously not turning people over and not attracting new people. Whereas a brand like MG is able to all of a sudden, you know, have, right. you know, be ahead of them by, by the, selling something that's different. The, the, the point you make, Steve, about the adventure brand and a bit of reinvention and, and recruiting new buyers in line with a, a different outlook um, for the company, I think is a really interesting one. And you made the point that in all of the Maverick, or well, not all, but a lot of the Maverick uh, PR shots that, that we've received early, it's kayaks, it's um, yeah. a little trailer with the jet ski on the back. And that's a big part of what Ford's doing in the US with a lot of its, um, what we would call like commercials, yeah. but are actually lifestyle focused pickups. Like um, even, even the F-150, I mean, best selling car in the US last time I checked, that may be different right now, but n- people don't need that many F-150s. Um, they're they're <laughs> well, buying them the for reasons yeah. other than carting stuff around. Yeah. Um, even it's a lifestyle vehicle and it could be a really great uh, path for, for Ford in Australia to follow. But I'll tell you something else too. If they'd made this decision two years ago before uh, Uncle Rona came to visit, that they, they would have been in the absolute box seat because every vehicle in Australia at the moment, you've seen what's happened with land cruisers, you've seen what's happened with uh, patrols. Everything, yeah. everything in Australia is about adventure. It's about road tripping. It's about lifestyle. So if Ford had made that call and had those vehicles ready to rock and roll, I reckon they'd be in the box seat. The problem with yeah. Uncle Rona is that Auntie Lockdown came at the same yeah. time. And yeah, when yeah, she yeah. comes toward <laughs> you at the family gathering, you want to turn the other way. Always stay away, always stay away from Auntie Lockdown. Auntie, no, Auntie Lockdown. The oh. <laughs> but anyway, I, I would say this for Ford. I, I thought they handled the shutdown, the, re, the retiring of the Falcon nameplate and the shift to Ranger almost perfectly. Like very difficult to fault, especially when you look at it alongside Holden GM's approach to the same thing. You know, for, yeah. for, do, do, you, do you reckon? I, I, oh, yeah. I thought it was, um, I, I, I can't say the same because they had the factory more or less idling. You know, they were just turning out very few cars. The, the, the kind of morale in the business was very low. I think the shining star in all of that was Toyota. In the, yeah, they, sure. they, they were determined that the last Camry they produced in Australia would be the best one they'd ever built. There was a huge kind of surge towards this finish line um, that, that pumped the whole company up. It was, it was really interesting. Ford seemed to be very long in the, in the, in the face, you know, oh, we're moping around, it's, it's all sad. I, I, I got a different impression, I've got to say. I guess what I'm referring to more specifically is the public perception of that shutdown. So their decision okay. to say, Falcon, we're so proud of that nameplate. It's done wonderful things for us in this country for hundreds of years, but we are retiring it and we're moving yeah. on. With the okay, yeah. fair call. I get you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah I have to agree with Ranger company, there. which is also developed in Australia for Australian conditions. It's the modern incarnation of the Falcon. So I thought that shift was masterfully done, whereas Holden's decision to say, well, we're going to bring in the city. Bring in the Commodore. Yeah, yeah. Call it a Commodore. It just meant that all the news about Holden for the following years was all about, oh, this isn't a Commodore. It's not a real Commodore, et cetera. Whereas no one mentioned Falcon again. It was all about yeah. Ranger. Yeah. But I, so that was a brave decision they made, and I think it turned out to be the right one. But further to your point, Otters, I think they're due another brave decision, and that is let's make another shift into this sort of lifestyle and adventure space. Yeah, which, which to be fair, now to be fair, again, not, not to bash the accountants down in Richmond or wherever they're based now, but I, you know, I think this goes back to what we were saying before. You mentioned one Ford. You know, I think an argument has to be made that Ford in America needs to sort of maybe take a better look at us, you know, and say, okay, maybe we need to give these guys 
mm. different product because what we're giving them out of Europe doesn't work for their market, which I think in, in you know, one thing I would say for GM is they, at least they gave, you know, somewhat out of necessity, granted, because they were pulling back out of Europe as, as it was, but, you know, they wanted, Holden wanted a seven seat SUV. And so they found a seven seat SUV to give them the, in, from GMC, yeah. you know, they yeah. found a way to give them the cars that they knew point. they needed. Now, mm. was it the right car necessarily? That's questionable, but it was, they found, they found a solution to get them what they need. And I think Ford globally, and particularly Ford in Detroit, needs to maybe take a look at the Australian market and say, you know, what do we want out of this market? We want them yep. to tick along, just selling a bunch of Rangers and developing Ranger for us. And and then, and that's it. You know, we want to- I, yeah. I think you're probably sadly close to the truth with the latter scenario, because, yeah. you know, we are such a tiny drop in a big ocean in terms yeah. of the, the Ford world. I wonder whether we shouldn't take uh, the bull by the horns and just pull a Sweden and start driving on the other side of the road. I was just, just you know, say that. Force, let's let's let's, let's force the issue. I reckon I might start tonight. It's going to be a bit dodgy, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I might just start switching over as a way to lead others to think the same I, way. I agree. And mate, if you have if you have an appropriate bumper sticker that tells people what you're doing, I don't think it's against the law. I, uh, mate, I'm with you. I, I've, I've said that for a while now. That uh, most most of the reason we miss out on these great cars is because we drive on the wrong side of the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do relative to the rest of the population. But but further, your final point there, Otis, I do think that like that that is their approach. Let's focus on Ranger, and and it has paid dividends for them over the last couple of years. There's no doubt about it but i always worry about having that many eggs in one basket you know yep. you, you never know what the like you know toyota's been on a tear lately the new hilux is coming who knows what that's going to be like compared to the new ranger so but, but you, think about the toyota they, they've got five models in the top 10 selling models like yep. they, they've they've got a broad portfolio yeah okay they own 20 percent of the market yep. but but they have over time effectively offered a quality product in just about every category, every passenger car and light commercial category yeah. um, and broadened their risk. Um, yeah. Whereas Ford is, uh, yeah, just a, a one, well, not the one trick pony I was going to say. They've also got a Mustang, but you, you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's, here's, the, here's the thing I think we need to remember. Like uh, AU Falcon, Ford yep. was riding high on the Falcon for a long time and they were either ahead or neck and oh, neck yeah. with Commodore for a yep. very long time. And and then AU Falcon came out, and it's fair to say it polarized opinion. You know, it took, it <laughs> that's took a very, dip, that very diplomatic the, way of saying it. That yeah. was that was, but that, I mean, the, the sad truth of it is that was the beginning of the end for Ford in Australia, you know, yep. and large cars in general. Like it, it yeah. tipped a lot of people out of large sedans, tipped a lot of people out of Fords and into Commodores. Yep. And, and and the danger Ford runs. Now, I'm not saying it's gonna happen, you know, we've seen spy shots of, of, of new Ranger and it looks okay, but you know, there is. There are no guarantees, you know, like, you know, BT50, like Mazda, to their credit, I think, you know, somewhat truly what we're talking about lifestyle youths, they they took like a, tried to put an SUV front on a ute at the same time SUV sales were on the rise. And to yeah. me, it seemed like a good risk to take, but unfortunately, it was a risk that didn't pay off, mm. you know, because people yeah. didn't want that style of, of ute. Now, maybe the new Ranger comes out and people decide they don't like the look of it. You know, and, well, then, and, then, I and suppose then where is Ford Australia? It, you know, our that, advice would be not to call it the AU Ranger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if they come out with a Ranger Forte or whatever it is. Yeah, that's uh, right. That's then right. We're, then we know they're in trouble. Yeah. We've yeah. ditched XLT and we're going to have Forte. And, um, All right. Uh, XLT, well, look, look let's, um, that, that's really good. Let's draw a line under it there. Good discussion. I think we covered the guts of, of your story, Steve, and, and yeah. people can have a look at that on the site, of course. And Sorry, Chester. I said, and tell us what you think. Do you agree? Exactly. That's what I was just going to say. So tell us what you think. Where do you sit in all of this? Would Ford, I mean, where we seem to go was they've got an opportunity in the whole adventure thing and, and very lifestyle is that or something else. Tell us, uh, tell us where you're at with all of that. But um, we're going to move now to our garage, to cars that you can actually buy, drive, all of that um, in Australia right now. Chesto, I'd like to lead with you, please. It's a Kia. It's a recent arrival. Tell us about your experience with it, please. Yes. So I have spent the last week or so in the Kia Nero Feb. So the Nero, of course, is offered with three different powertrains, EV, uh, sorry, hybrid Feb and EV. I'm in the Feb version of it. Now, I won't bore you with the details here because, you know, you're familiar with the small SUV format. You know that Kia's, you, you've got a good read by now, I'm sure, on what sort of vehicles Kia's producing. But I wanted to drill down for a moment on the fuel use figure. So 
basically the FEV, if you ever see a FEV fuel use bigger, it, it's always a little bit of nonsense. It can be anything from 0 0.9 litres per 100 to this one's official figure is 1.3 litres per 100 on the combined cycle. This is not a dig at Kia, but in FEVs in general, the way they take that measurement is almost impossible. In fact, it is impossible to replicate in real life because it takes into account you driving pure EV for such a large percentage of it that those numbers are just unattainable. But I have put 400 Ks on this car this week and I thought to myself, all right, well, let's see what it actually gets to. So basically without really charging the battery and by using, uh, without switching into EV mode, just driving it as a vehicle with a bit of EV help, it has returned 4.1 liters per hundred, which I was actually really impressed with. Yep. I did some yep. basic math on it. It means it cost me about $21 to drive my 400 Ks, yep. um, which, is, which is really pretty good. Um, and more importantly, I've still got, after all of that, I've still got, I, I haven't refueled it. I've still got about just under half a tank left or something. So, you know, it's got plenty of go in it for, for, for a small SUV. And again, that's without plugging it in. Yep. The only downside I found to it though, part of that trip was up at the top of the mountains. And what I always like to do in, in regenerative cars is bump up the brake regen on the way back down the hill, because it's possibly the longest downhill run in Sydney, right? Yeah, it's great. So I kept it on it all the way down, regen to the absolute maximum, did not put on one single bar of extra electricity. Wow, extra electric I see. <laughs> uh, the regen oh. didn't quite work for me. But but in the fair income department, I'd be I'd be really happy to be returning 4.1 over yep. a really, you know, really different series of driving, uphill, downhill, freeway, urban, you know, suburban. Um, yeah, so I was really impressed. 4.1 is pretty good. You buy a FEV and uh, what's your fuel bill plumber? Excellent. I, th I think there's a lot to recommend plug-in hybrid, isn't there? The, the only thing about it is the plugging in bit. You know, yeah. the, as you say, in the numbers that it returns in real world, as you've discovered, it's, um, it's pretty, pretty handy. Yep. Um, but it's just that well, as soon as we get to um, just you drive over the pad and you're charging and whatever uh, at home, that'll yep. that'll be uh, that'll be a big step up for that kind yeah, of. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, the only pro the problem with with Fevs, I think, is that um, so this one takes about two hours or two and a half hours to charge at its absolute fastest from zero yep. to four, which isn't that isn't that long to be fair. Hmm. The downside is I just think most people buy a Fev, and this is. A, a, a patented chesto guess here. There's no evidence to back this up whatsoever. But I think most people buy <laughs> FEVs and then just never plug them in. I think they just treat them as cars, right? I know that I've fallen for that trap myself over the years where I've have I've had FEVs and for the first month I'm really excited about plugging them in. And then six weeks later I'm like, oh it yeah. Drops, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Tell it Anyone out there, tell us if you're a FEV driver, tell yeah. us what you do. Then you I'll actually do plug it in because then what you're left with is a vehicle that has a really small engine that's working really hard to drive because you're never charging the battery. So if you do drive a FEV, it's worth plugging it in. I think that's kind of the uh, the plus side of a FEV is if you're disciplined and you're, and you're really into it, you can yeah drag your fuel bill right down. But equally, if you're feeling a bit slack and you can't be bothered or, you're, or you want to take a longer trip, you can get away with it. You can just... You're just going to spend a bit more at the Bowser. So, and you know. I, I agree. That's the beauty of it. And I, I, yeah. I have had uh, Honda fares before where I've made a point of trying to drive an entire week using nothing but battery and have done so successfully. And it's actually quite rewarding just to get a little, little peek behind the curtains for the listeners here. Most of our vehicles we get in for a week at a time. Some we can take for longer as long-term tests to see what they like to live with. But it's, so at the end of that week, you always take your fuel readings, et cetera, to see where you how you've traveled. And it's something quite nice about seeing it at 0, 0.0 at the end. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it can be done. Cool, and that, that's and cool. Coming. There's so many FEVs that I think are going to hit the market. In it. By the end of this decade, there's going to be a lot of FEVs. You need to talk to any European brand and you know, with their emissions standards, the way they're going, the middle of the decade, I think FEVs are going to just be the, in right. some respects, the dominant force. Ma right. Mazda, Mazda overnight announced, I actually just wrote this story yesterday, so I should be able to find it fairly quickly, but Mazda overnight announced that they would be launching five hybrid, five new plug-in hybrid and three new EVs by around 2025. So Wow, amazing. They're coming. Great, great. All right. Thank you, Chesto. Steve, I'd like to start off your little bit with uh, a check-in again on your family ancestry and the vehicle that is behind you last mm -hmm. time. This is not you're what's on. in the garage, just to be no, clear. No, no, that's right. Last time we were on the pod, you, you spoke about some uh, adventurous elders in your family. Please fill us in on what's behind you here. 
Okay, so this is uh, let me just let me just get out of the way here. This is uh, this is called the Fred H. Stewart Enterprise. Uh, it was built by my great grandfather Donald Harkness, who I think yeah we discussed last time uh, was a an engineer and actually a race car driver. Um, so if you're wondering, genetics uh, <laughs> neither of those conditions are genetic. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. um, so he raced he raced in the 1920s and 30s uh this car behind me this they tried to set the world land speed record in the early 1930s 1932 um yeah so it's it's got a um napier lion aero engine w12 uh, made about thousand horsepower unreal um, unreal yeah so it was uh it was it seems like a it seems like a far out thing, you know. We see guys like Roscoe McGlashan try and set the world land speed record at the moment, which is like, uh, like past the the, the, the um, speed is speed is sound, right? Yeah. So um, it seems pretty far fetched nowadays, but back then, I mean, that that is a very similar car to what his contemporaries. Uh, um, and Donald Steve, Campbell. do you know what was the venue? Where was the intended? Where was the intended? He he, did, he had a crack at it. Yeah, so that it was. A, it had a different driver. Unfortunately, well, he, he at one point that we it all ended up. Unfortunately, it all ended up in, in a bit of a mess. Uh, okay. Because they, they went over to New Zealand to all right. ninety mile beach. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, what they didn't know at the time was that uh, the the weather was just not that great in summer in North Island, New Zealand. The beach would wash up uh, uh, a bunch of quite sharp shells. Um, nasty right. and they had there has an argument around uh cooling because you'll notice obviously it doesn't have a, a conventional radiator my great grandfather had a rather experimental uh chemical cooling system that he wanted to use wow um okay it was all it was all a bit uh, it's actually detailed in a book called the wizard of oz uh if anyone is super keen to to buy that um, the short answer Stephen, is that it was uh it, it probably could have been better researched and was a bit light on detail and that part of course that's a family trait that was <laughs> Well, you know, the, fun, the funny thing is, uh, at the same time, well, you know, I, I, I met uh, Wing Commander Andy Green, you know, the uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Record. I've interviewed him too. Yeah. 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 Fascinating bloke. But he was talking about them setting the, the land speed record, you know, with Bloodhound. Yeah. And they had, at that point, this was still at least a year before the car was going to be, they wanted to do it on a, on a big dry salt bed in South Africa. Huck skin pan. Yeah. Yeah. And they had, they had literally hired an entire village of people to clear every rock pebble piece yeah, of, yeah, you yeah. know, like gum wrapper off the thing. So, you know, obviously, yeah. Poor, poor venue choice was, was the big issue, but um, yeah, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a cool part of. Uh, That's history. very cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Very yeah. cool. Well, look, thank you for that. But let's yes. move into uh, more contemporary times and the vehicle that you've been driving recently, please. Yes, it does not have a 1,000 horsepower, but it no. is the... <laughs> I've been driving the Hyundai Sonata N-Line, yep. um, which is obviously their new one and only Sonata. So Yes, um, that's right. Yeah, I think, you know, I think we've seen... Uh, we've seen we've already had reviews on it. It's, a, it's quite a... You know, to be honest, while sedans are obviously not the flavour of the month, uh, and haven't been for for a while now. Um, if that's still your thing, it's a very good one. I, I quite yeah. like it. it's quite it's quite a, it's got quite a premium uh, finish to it. Um, you know the way that the the lights actually extend up halfway yes. up the bonnet. Like I think it just amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's and then inside it's you know it's got uh, just a more again a more premium sort of cabin that we've seen uh, mm. in those sort of you know that mid size sedan segment was was pretty. Uh, let's be frank it was pretty average not that long ago you know they really like it wasn't just camry that was white goods on wheels i think a lot of those mid-sized sedans were pretty forgettable mm. um and yeah. now i think this one you know it's got 213 kilowatts got over 400 newton meters like you know it's not i don't think it's a it's not a race car but it's certainly it's certainly quick you know yeah. and it's it's got you know it's got that sort of easy kind of acceleration that you want out of a sportier sedan to, to, to your point about that headlight uh treatment coming up across uh, along the bonnet line there the back of it you could easily slap a volvo badge on there yeah. or uh, you know a mercedes badge it's it's really quite dramatic i think it's successful i reckon they've pulled it off really nicely i, I actually reckon it straddles the line between really nicely designed and, and over designed and it just ah. 
for me, it just falls under the line. And, and unfortunately, you can't say that about all, all cars in the fleet at the moment. But that one, I think, is uh, that one straddles the line really nicely, in my opinion. Yeah, okay. that's a good way to that's a good way to put it. Actually, I think yeah, it's 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 there is a danger. Hyundai, I think I've written stories about this before. Hyundai is really pushing design and yeah sometimes i think you know anytime you do bold design sometimes you're going to hit and sometimes you're going to miss and yeah. um I think well it's all styling isn't it you know they could make it super functional but they're, they're trying to make a point of difference through that more decorative approach to even the sides of the car those angles that have been put into the sides of the car i remember i forget which um designer it was was talking about how expensive that is to do yeah. uh, to get yeah. it right because you've got to get all your shut lines accurate in multiple planes it's so much easier to make it a very gentle smooth curve to put those angles in is something that's normally in higher end cars what yeah i budget for that one Stephen? Oh, it's, it's, it's well it is it is uh pretty uh x i think for, for again from inside it's 5990 so it's yeah that's you know, 20 isn't it it's it's not it's you know it's a very deliberate choice you know you're making right. a very deliberate choice to spend a bit more to get a you know, uh, something that's, that's, you know, quite frankly, now, you know, uh, a left field choice, you know, and mm. this is sort of the um, alternative lifestyle to be uh, driving a sedan. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right. That's good. Now, uh, cue Chesto wind up because I've been <laughs> driving a, <laughs> a Merck AMG GLA 35. Uh, so it's a, Two litre turbo four, 225 kilowatts. So not a million miles away from that inline uh, Sonata. 400 Newton meters though uh, from a two litre. Uh, eight speed dual clutch, all wheel drive, $83,700. Yeah. Um, now it is a really nice engine. That, that two litre engine, in fact, it had me thinking not for the first time, why would you bother with the 45? Um, this, this car is pretty much all you need. It's a really nice engine. Good ride, particularly in comfort mode, despite running on 20-inch rims. You know, they're enormous rims for a car of this size. It's not exactly huge, and it still rides nicely. Um, it's been updated with that Panamericana grill, which makes it just that little bit tougher. I quite like the look of that. Yeah, the MB, like MBUX, um, you know, multimedia system is still, I think, a model of efficiency. I find it really uh, easy to use. Um, then it's 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 built to a, a, a very nice uh, level of quality as you'd expect. On the negatives, I found it was I was doing U turns and it felt like the uh, the front end was trying to deconstruct itself because I think it's got a front locking diff and it just uh -huh. wants to kind of graunch and kind of lurch around. That's not a great feeling, but hey, it kind of goes with the territory. Yeah. And but what I did say, what what I did think, sorry, is that you do need to slip it into sport most of the time to get that sense of urgency. If if you're not in there, it's not reluctant, but it's just not quite as peppy as you'd like it to be. So I found myself in sport, and it almost tips the scales the other way, where you're a little too urgent. So um, that was a teensy bit frustrating, but but not a big deal. It, you've got to be ready to sign on for a compact SUV that's a performance car. Yeah. You, you've got to be after that. It's it's not my cup of tea, but I think it it fulfills that brief pretty well. And there you have it, dear reader. I've I've done a uh, fuel economy test in a Kia. <laughs> 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 and James through the form has been rocking around in the AMG. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just just on what you're saying, though, I actually have to. I agree with you about the engines. In that comparing the AMG 35s to 45s, I find that yeah. 45 like it's obviously massive power for such a small engine, and it does yeah. a great. In, in many respects, it's great that it can achieve that, but it is it does feel very highly strung. It does. You know, it like does. It and feels like you've got to really you got to be up it to really be in its to have it work in its best state. Whereas the 35 is more livable. It's just I, I agree. And I think what it does, Steve, for my, for mine, it makes the 35 a distinct, uh, it gives it its own little niche to fill. It's yeah. not as if it's a halfway house to the 45. Oh, you, you, you didn't reach up to the 45. You just stopped at this one. Yeah. I think it's a really valid choice in its own right. It's a, an enjoyable car to drive and they, they both, you know, have their place. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. For me, it's the tech. I think Mercedes tech is just so on point at the moment in, in cabin tech. Yeah, uh, Volkswagen do a really great job as well, actually. But it has seemed like Mercedes has been leading the charge on in-cabin tech for years now. Yeah, I keep waiting for everyone else to catch up. Yeah, no, it's good in that regard. That so so here we go. Feedback uh, is back. back. Um, and uh, last week, 
uh, we were talking about, do we love SUVs too much? And that was another Stephen Otley uh, opinion story. And well, that's how I summed it up anyway. No, that's um, pretty fair. I mean, I just, I think for me, just for background for our uh, dear viewers is, you know, I, I was driving a uh, Kia Stonic and just kept looking up at people in hatchbacks. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> well, looking across, I'm like, wasn't the point of these to sit higher like I, yeah. I, and i understand that i understand that as a, as a reason to buy an suv because everyone else is driving suvs and dual cab utes and you want to see where you're going yeah but like when you like when you actually run some of the numbers on these cars you're just like sorry did we yeah. jump back in round in circles like what, what, i just, I I just like to say i was behind a model y uh tesla last night it blocked out the sun i couldn't i couldn't <laughs> see anything um around that thing god it's a behemoth but uh, model x or model y uh, big pardon, sorry, Model X. Uh, my bad, my bad. So um, we did have some feedback, and Jeffrey Lynn, and in response to that, I think every member of ELO is actually a, a fan of the show. Um, he questions SUVs, says the small ones make very little sense, particularly. But he bought a Honda CRV in 2019, and he says, "quote Not because I'm a fan of SUVs. Bracket I'm not!" Exclamation mark. Um, but because increasing arthritis was making it more and more difficult for him to get in and out of otherwise perfectly good nine-year-old Mitsubishi Lancer. So, yeah. I mean, Jeff has, uh, Jeffrey has a certain issue and others do as well. It is undoubtedly easier to get in and out of uh, an SUV. He says he's not aging so much disgracefully as ungracefully um, <laughs> because he just finds it uh, troubling to clamber in and out of the car. He says the CRV is comfortable to enter and leave without having to bend down too far. He's over 185 centimetres tall. Um, CVT is not quite as good as the Lancer's uh, transmission. He finds the CVT a bit boring, uh, but the performance and economy is better. He also had a go at a couple of contenders, the Tucson. Yep. He said the engine was thrashy and struggled a bit. The CX-5 didn't handle speed bumps very well, and his head only just skimmed under the top of the door on opening. So he makes a good point that it is just that ease of access as much as when you're in the thing or, or what you're loaded up with, that's a big deal for SUVs. That, that was always the argument initially, wasn't it? The high hip point and then the, the, yeah. the better vision. But uh, yeah, as you pointed out in your story, it's certainly changed since then. There's yeah. not, a lot, not a lot of high hip point action in the static. No, that's right. I, mean, I don't look, you know, far be it from me to tell people why to buy cars. And I understand like, well, they, no. that is your job, but anyway, go on. <laughs> <laughs> not like not forcing them, mate. It's a free country. Wow, that's I'll a light bulb opinion. moment right there. I'll give it my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like you can. Look, I'm no buy, car expert, but <laughs> people buy people buy cars for all different reasons. Is really my point. I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not a fascist here, mate. I'm not trying to offer, you know, tell people what they can and can't buy. I'm mean, yeah. merely what they should buy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I just think, I, uh, you know, the. You know, there's a variety of reasons to buy them. And I, th I think a big part of it is, you know, looking at those Stonics and of the world with the Rio, the Stonic, you know, the, the look of it is why people are going to buy it. Isn't it? There's sure. nothing really different about the, the driving experience or the, the, yeah. know, the hip point or any of that stuff, but it just Stories looks different. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've got I one word for you, Ignis. I mean, yeah. is that an SUV? Uh, in name only, I'd say. Yeah, I think that was in the story. It's it's yeah. smaller yeah. than the than the Swift. So, yeah. you know, like, but yeah. it's um, yeah, it's just you, you can get into the semant you can get into semantics of it, and and that's a you know it's a marketing term that that car brands throw around. But uh, yeah, okay. And look, Zamuro, Zamuro uh, says the biggest failure of the modern car market is the drive towards higher riding vehicles without any other benefits, rather than you know lining up with some trend yeah. uh, to reducing all the fuel economy and emissions benefits of the last 10 years, including uh, the craze with dual cab utes as family cars. I think we're probably using more fuel than we used to. Now, I, I can't verify whether we collectively, the Australian motoring driving public is using more fuel. I doubt it somehow. But but he makes a, a, a good point that in a way, we're heading in a direction that's not exactly uh, environmentally friendly with with the dual cab you thing. I, I would argue two things I'd say to that. One, I would argue that we probably are using more diesel fuel now than at any point in our history, I would have thought, just because of the simple proliferation of diesel dual cab utes. Yep. But secondly, when you travel through Europe, you, you, people just don't care about 
big SUVs. They don't care about ride height or, or anything else, really. The people who live in cities want the smallest, most fuel-efficient, economical car they can possibly get their hands on for so many reasons. They're cheaper to run, easier to park, and, and they've come to the conclusion that they really are all the car they need. Yeah. I live in inner city of Sydney or the inner west of Sydney. There's not a lot of little micro cars around anymore. It, it is all diesel dual cabs. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But there is a point to be made there that it does undo all the benefits. No one's buying a car that suits their lifestyle anymore. Everyone just wants a high riding ute or SUV. Yeah, interesting. Well, the, and, well and it depends. It's my job to tell people what to buy. So stop buying. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I just, I, you know, I actually did a number of years ago, did a comparison test um, of like for like models in their range. So a Mazda six wagon versus a cx5 mm-hmm. and a, and you, you can tell us a few years ago because yep. it was a commodore wagon versus a, a captiva right a, and there was a it was another one in there i think of i30 wagon and a tucson and, and and in every instance you know we compared them for space and practicality oh. but also driving dynamics and fuel efficiency and in every situation uh the wagon was more fuel efficient better to drive and I, you know the, I, I, the ironic part is yeah, they're generally speaking bigger. They had more space right. in the back and a bigger right. boot. Um, yeah. And you are speaking my language, aren't you? I, yeah. I, I've, I've always lamented the death of the wagon. I, I think, mm. you know, in, in, ride height aside, there's almost nothing an SUV can't do that a good wagon can't do better. And we've forgotten that SUV stands for sport utility. These vehicles offer neither of those things. They should just be called Vs. They're not. They're, well, they're, they're I've, argued, I've argued that we should start calling them crossovers. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think there's an argument, like particularly cars like the Stonic, it's not yeah. really an SUV. It's a crossover. It's a, it's a blurred line between a, a, an SUV as well, we know it and a, and a small well, car. They, ma- they make me cross. They make me cross, and I wish it was over. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing: all motoring journalists want to drive wagons, right? We're all you these know. wagon obsessed people, but people don't buy wagons, Chester. So we can tell them, tell them what to buy, but they yep, don't necessarily true. listen to us. That's because my fascist reign hasn't begun yet, but it will. Now, the, the, can I just say one more thing on the on the SUV front for a moment? We have that Sonic, right? And I, this is a, I'm not even being facetious here. This is a genuine question. What is it about that vehicle that classifies it as an SUV? Because to me, how, how's it not classed a hatchback? I, I don't, I, what's the, is there an actual technical difference between it? No, it's because someone decides that's what it's going to be called. Oh, okay. So there's no actual like measurement where you say, all right, this falls in on SUV camp. Not to my knowledge. I mean, the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries does segment the market uh, according to what it sees as competitive sets, uh, largely on size and sometimes uh, body type and, and all of that stuff. So someone somewhere in a marketing department says, yeah, we're going to, we're going to make this an SUV yeah, irrespective right. of what it is physically. And then that is reflected in the way it's kind of placed in the market. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Because to me, I look at that car and think, well, that is just a hatchback, but not, yeah. even, not even a particularly high riding hatchback, like just the hatchback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Look, the, the other thing we touched on last week, Tom, our own Tom White um, had attended the launch of uh, Golf 8 and was talking about that. And our old mate de Kulk, um, who I know, uh, I'm guessing is uh, Germany, at least moved from Germany to Australia recently. Mm-hmm. Um, Golf 8 said to be the last but one generation, just getting one more facelift and out. I read the coverage in German press when ID3 was launched and they said it's designed to replace the Golf like the Golf replaced the original Beetle back in the day. Mm-hmm. And that put me in mind of what I what I. Uh, believed to be that the golf arrived and it was very popular, but it didn't kill the beetle. The, the beetle kept going yeah. um, for some time after golf arrived. And I just wonder whether there's room for both this time around as well. I mean, you'd, you'd have to think so, given that they are, you know, given the increasing but still quite slow take up of electric vehicles, especially in this country, you'd think they'd, have, they'd go side yeah. by side for some time. Well, yeah. it's funny you mentioned that because I've literally just uh, written a story for the website uh, about the future of small cars because Kia has confirmed that they will do another generation Serato, okay. which has just had its facelift. So it's probably got another three or four years. Yep. So yep. probably looking middle of the decade. Uh, yep. They'll do another one, which obviously given the, the shared DNA, that'll be a, there'll be a new Hyundai i30, you'd imagine. Yeah. Um, and if it's coming in the middle of the decade, you know, getting back to the Feb stuff, you'd imagine it'll there'll probably be an electric version. There'll probably be Absolutely. Feb versions or yeah. hybrids. Um, because Kia, you know, Kia uh, 
is a believer that there's still there's still potential in the small car market. You know, and I yeah. think it's actually interesting to talk to them about it because they kind of acknowledge that it's it's declining and there's you know there's diminishing returns, but there's mm. still returns to be had. To be and you never go broke making a profit. So if, if they can get money out of that segment, yeah, why not still be in it? Their, their right. market share has more than tripled in the last right. five years. Yeah, but ironically, their sales have haven't even doubled. Right, right. There you go. Telling, yeah. telling. Interesting. Um, also on Golf 8, our very good friend Peter Panousis, uh says he's just like Tom. He's, I'm excited AF uh, for the new golf. Uh, he says, not, not sure why. I've never owned a VW before. Um, but, but the, but Obviously. The Im- <laughs> That's right. <laughs> As a but the, images, no, being- the images are striking a chord with me, but I can't seem to find the option for leather seats unless I go for the GTI which at 65K is a ripoff. Uh, and he says, looking forward to the video. And it, it reminded me of when my brother bought a, back in the day, bought a Saab 900 and he couldn't get leather. And he just took the car to a trimmers and got a leather interior put in it. So uh, maybe that's a solution for Peter um, is just to take his new Golf 8 off to the trimmers. It would surely be there somewhere though, wouldn't it? That would be weird for, for Volkswagen to not offer an upper spec model. I'm not like, sure. There is an up, I'm not there sure. There is a... There is the R line. Does the R line not get leather seats? Oh, let's have a look into it um, on Peter's behalf. His shopping I, uh, list, Peter's shopping list, by the way, is lengthening uh, by the week. He, every vehicle that we touch on is somewhere in his shopping orbit, and he hasn't in years landed on whatever he's going to buy. He's been procrastinating for some time. Right. Um, I actually only had a look at the Golf 8 up close uh, yesterday, as, as it were. It's, it's, I mean, it is, it's quite a sharp interior, you know. I yep. think, you know, the, the technology, you know, and the general sort of, you know, improvement in the cabin is, is, is you know, very noticeable. You know, there's obviously okay. there's an evolutionary design to it overall, but the cabin is, is a huge leap forward. Yeah, I'm, cool. I'm, cool. I'm currently building a golf eight, so stand by. <laughs> yeah, I'll have a look at myself. <laughs> while, while you're doing that, I think another commenter, John Bart, really got to the heart of the show when he said uh, he made a couple of comments. One was uh, CRV to Peugeot suspension, WTF is uh, not even listening, LMFAO, what's the point of others' input? Poor form. And look, I may resemble that remark. I, I may have been uh, jumping all over the place. And then he followed it up. Uh, with his take on the show's format, smile and nod your heads. Yep, yep, yeah, ha, 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 yep, worst ever, lol. So uh, John's not exactly a fan of the program. No. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just we, we, call- take, we take all feedback on board. Just to clarify that, that was an episode that I wasn't on. Yeah. <laughs> And fair, fair, fair cool. to say, JC, we take more feedback on board, but we do have a preference for the positive. You'd have to I know. I'm not, more on board. <laughs> put it this way: I'm not going to stop nodding my head, and I'm not going to, um, you know, stop having a laugh every now and then. And well done to all those who correctly identified what was the P76 facelift study behind Byron last week. That was his wallpaper behind yeah. him, and those pics came courtesy of the P76 Club of WA. Really amazing uh, shots of what would have been the facelifted P76 from the mid-1970s. And uh, they turned those shots up. Apparently, they've only just uh, come to light after wherever they've been hiding uh, for the intervening decades. I found them really interesting. Um, And viewers on YouTube will have them up there again um, this time around. Now, just for the record, I think you can get a Golf 8 Life and yep. select the comfort and style package. And I yep. think, don't hold me to this, but I think you'll find you get leather. Leather, leather in that. There you go, Peter. I'm, looking, you're, I'm, you're I'm, looking, set. At the, I'm looking at the brochure. I, I can't see. I, I actually, I think you can only get leather appointed seats in the GTI. Oh, well, maybe. Like, well, look, if it, it might be a package thing. Cloth micro fleece. Maybe you have to package. buy a package. Yeah. I think Chesto's unearthed it. That you have to yeah, stump up for an option package. package. I think will do it for you. I think, but uh, but again, don't hold me to that. That was a very quick look. Cool. All right. Look, I think we'll leave it there because at this point we have oh, reached okay. the finish line. Sorry, Steve. I'm going to smile and nod. <laughs> uh, so I want to say thank you, Steve. Thank you. And thank you, Chesto. And thank you, everybody. <laughs> And thanks to our bootylicious coffee captain, Twitter fascist and executive Sherpa, Mr. Pritchard, for his skill and determination in bringing this all together. Today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, I speak fluent movie quotes, sarcasm, and whale. 
Um, he has Obama pants on and shopping basket sandals, an extraordinary look. Um, let, us, let us know your thoughts. You can find Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple podcast listener, please rate and review us. Of course, you can make your, your comments on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. But before we go, um, a mate of mine was out in the bush uh, this week, he was telling me, when his old banger started to cough and pretty soon came to a shuddering halt. Um, looking under the bonnet at the decidedly dead engine, he's scratching his head when a voice says, check your distributor cap clips. He looks around but can't see anyone. He's back pondering the problem when the voice says, I said, check the dizzy cap clips. Looking up, he sees a horse in the paddock he's next to, looking over the fence. I'm bracing. <laughs> nah, he thinks, can't be but felt compelled to check anyway. And sure enough, the cap was loose. Naturally, he's shocked, but fixes the cap and the car fires right up. Without looking at the horse, he speeds away to the next town, walks into the first pub he comes to and orders a large scotch. The barman, seeing his ashen face and confused expression, asks what's up. So old mate explains what happened. Barman asks, was it a black stallion? Uh, yeah, it was. Why? Well, you're lucky. It wasn't the grey mare in the same paddock. She knows stuff all about cars. Oh, God. <laughs> that is, it was did so Zach long, Snyder but... write that joke? Like, I thought that was, I thought that was, that was turned into a mini series. That That's the Snyder cut. It's, it's not the Snyder first time cut. I've gone for a longer joke. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah, watched yeah. the. I used to watch the director's cut of the Lord of the Rings trilogy oh, while that joke oh, was going on there. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs>